Hi again, class. Um, let me open up chapter one. Hopefully you can you know, follow along with the slides or just watch the presentation. Um, we need to be as, as efficient as possible um, with these types of videos, so I can't be too lengthy um, because unfortunately uh, the video will cut off on me if I, if I talk for too long. So I'm going to try to be as efficient as possible and cover all the high points and important points, underscoring all the important issues in Chapter 1. Now the good thing about the way our course is organized is um, Chapter 1, um, uh, your, your quiz next week will only be on Chapter 1. Um, and if you take a look at the syllabus, you'll see that the next week will be Chapter 2 and 3. And the following week will be chapter four, which I, I, I kind of think is probably the most important chapter, at least of um, business 945. Uh, chapter four is because it's going to go through time value of money. The long story short, your, your, your quizzes in the first part in business 945 will only be on one chapter each. And that, that I think, is a, a good thing for the student to only have to concentrate on one chapter for quizzes. Unfortunately, in Business 950, that won't be the case because we're going to make our way through the entire textbook. But let's get started here in um, Chapter 1, the Introduction to Financial Management. So I'd love to ask the students and go around the class and talk about you know, who's been exposed to finance in what way. Um, and I think one of the interesting things you'll find in this chapter, if you have been exposed to finance, you may have been exposed to areas of finance, but maybe not directly corporate finance. Or maybe you have been exposed to corporate finance. Maybe you've been exposed to international finance. We're going to talk about different areas of finance in Chapter 1. Um, the majority of the text, what we're going to really be discussing, is um, decision criteria. And what does that mean? That means making decisions. Um, Finance is a really interesting area of business because it's really combining accounting with economics. It's kind of like a midway point of using the data that's provided in accounting with the theoretical elements that you learned in economics to kind of make decisions um, for a company or for an organization. So we're going to be talking about, you know, whether it's worthwhile for a company maybe to expand, um, and how would they make a capital investment type decision like that? So let's start off with our outline. Before we get into this outline, it's important to point out up on the top right, you'll see the little guy surfing a wave. Um, if you click on that within your PowerPoint presentations that you download onto your computer, you'll realize that there's a website that accompanies the text, and that's a little link um, to take you to the website. You'll see them periodically through the slides. I think that that's helpful for the student. Um, sometimes they'll take you to different types of links that are relevant to whatever we're talking about at the time. I, a couple other things that I like about the way that this textbook um, is organized is um, the fact that it starts out with an outline. It talks about learning objectives. Um, up front so you can kind of know what you should need to know. Um, our next slide is going to talk about key concepts and skills. That's basically the learning objectives. So I think it's good that you start out with that sort of thing and then you kind of go through the meat of the material. So this chapter is going to be, uh, its outline is first we're going to take a look at finance. Then we're going to get into Business finance and the financial manager. We'll talk about different forms of the business organization, which I think you may be familiar with already. We'll talk about the goal of financial management, which is different from the goals in other fields. We'll talk about what's known as the agency problem and control of the corporation. And fin finally, we'll get into financial markets in the corporation. So what do we want to take away? We want to have a basic understanding of financial management decisions and the role of the financial manager. <coughs> we also want to um, talk about the goal of financial management. We want to talk about and understand the financial implications of different forms of the business organization. And we want to discuss the conflicts of interest that can arise between owners and managers. 
Okay, so basic areas of, of finance. This is a key aspect of what, what we're going to be discussing in this class. Um, corporate finance. Corporate finance is the main subject of our course. It's also called business finance. It sounds just like a corporation, but it's not really true. It's, it, it's, it's broader. Business finance is probably the better term, but we're going to dive more into corporate finance or business finance a little later. Instead, we're going to really kind of focus right now into investments, financial institutions, and international finance. Just so you know, each of these topics will be discussed more as we move forward. However, discussion of that corporate finance, like I said, is going to be done later in the chapter. At this point in the text, um, I'm going to see if I can do this here live on video. Um, the textbook wants to take a, a, a dip into... What are the types of careers that um, you could have within the area of corporate finance or investments or financial institutions or international finance? So what are the types of careers that fall into these different categories? And for that, I'm going to see if I can play this. Bear with me for a moment. students are really well prepared to take on many different career paths in finance. Um, they can certainly move into... As I mentioned, she's going to talk you through some areas of, of um, that a, a student could go into within the realm of finance. So. To all kinds of banking, retail banking, commercial banking, investment banking, um, but also use their finance skills a little bit more uh, broadly, perhaps uh, like consulting um, or moving into um, even sales positions. Uh, finance skills are very valued in the marketplace, and so finance students find themselves, you know, certainly with the ability to go into very specific financial roles, but also more broad roles. In terms of companies, uh, when I think about our recruiting this year, uh, we have extremely strong partnerships with firms like Goldman Sachs, um, Citigroup, Visa for corporate finance, um, and then thinking about some of these more general or broader opportunities for finance students, they, uh, they find themselves interviewing with companies like Hitachi Consulting and Accenture. Um, and then one of the things that I really love about working with LEAD students is they're thinking about using their finance skills in some different ways, maybe looking at the nonprofit sector, uh, looking at some of the government jobs, and then certainly with the entrepreneurship focus at LEADS, thinking about starting up their own business. So a wide variety of career opportunities for students. Okay, I don't want to uh, go too in-depth there. You can look at the rest of that video if you'd like later. Um, I think that the, the important thing for uh, students to take away are just some of the possible career paths one could undertake with an educational background in finance. Um, and also, um, if you did decide, you know, maybe to change career into a financial type career, what are some of the key steps you, you would take in order to prepare yourself for that career? Um, okay, so getting back into our PowerPoint presentation. We just gave an overview of these. Now we're going to get a little bit more in depth into the different basic areas of finance. So next, we're talking about investments, um, which is the is a very big area of finance. Uh, this works with financial assets such as stocks and bonds. It would involve valuation of those financial assets, um, discussing risk versus return, and asset allocation. Um, so we will talk a little bit about this investment aspect, and you're definitely going to be exposed to it with our financial gain, um, but it's really a different area from what the major meat of what our course is discussing. Uh, job opportunities in this field would include stuff like a stockbroker or a financial advisor, a portfolio manager maybe, a security analyst. They would all fall underneath the investment umbrella. So you can think of, you know, Money management here. Um, so, the, you know, here the, the careers could be a portfolio manager, a mutual fund analyst. 
And then the financial planning aspect also probably would fall under investments, um, you know, like financial consultants. Um, financial institutions would be the third area of basic finance. Here, um, companies are going to be the ones that specialize in financial matters, such as banks, commercial and investment, credit unions, savings and loans. Insurance companies fall within financial institutions as well. So insurance is considered to be an area of finance, which you may not have known. Um, brokerage firms also fall under here. Um, job opportunities for this one, you know, if you've clicked on your little web surfer guy down here, it'll take you to some information on this. Job opportunities in this could be in commercial banking, like I said, insurance, or maybe investment banking. Then we have uh, the area of, and the fourth area, uh, and in some ways a really broad area of international finance. Um, here is it's an area of specialization within each of the areas discussed so far. So, for example, you know, uh, corporate finance has a bit of international finance included if you're doing corporate finance abroad. Um, same can be said for investments abroad or um, or even if you're discussing financial institutions abroad. So it's an area of specialization within each of the areas discussed so far. It may allow you to work in other countries or at least travel on a regular basis. Um, you would need to be familiar with exchange rates here and political risk. We'll briefly discuss exchange rates towards the end of the class, um, but um, we're not going to get too in-depth here. International finance is, is a big, large course, so we can't get into everything. Um, you need to understand the customs of other countries if you're going to excel in international finance. Um, speaking a, a foreign language would also be helpful. Um, so examples of careers here maybe would be like something like a currency trader. Okay, so here is a more concrete visualization of what we just discussed. You have corporate finance, financial institutions, and investments, which would all be considered domestic. And in fact, all those areas could also be international as well. So there's four basic areas of finance, three of which would be considered domestic and one international. So international finance is not really separate, but more specialized of an area within the three primary areas. Um, and with globalization, the need to be well-versed in both domestic and international is obviously more important. Okay, so why would we want to study finance? Well, um, the truth is finance is used across organizations. For example, in marketing, if you're interested in marketing, uh, marketing Folks use finance for budgets, for market research, for marketing financial products. So it's certainly used in marketing. And of course, it's used in accounting too. Um, there's a dual function to accounting and finance. Um, preparation of financial statements is going to involve finance, of course. Management is going to use finance for strategic thinking, job performance, and profitability. And then, of course, we're using finance all the time with personal finance where you have budgeting, retirement planning, college planning, day-to-day -day cash flow issues, all would be under the umbrella of personal finance. So, you know, business majors, anyone who's majoring in business, such as you all, you we all need to have a good understanding of finance. It's important for both the professional and personal reasons. And most companies want cost-benefit analysis of some sort, and finance will help with that. So you need the financial principles to do that sort of work. Um, and of course, then personally, finance is needed as well. Okay, so let's get back to our areas again. And we talked about business finance or corporate finance already, but let's, let's focus in, in again on that. Um, some important questions that are answered using finance or corporate finance would be, what long-term investments should the firm take on? Where will they get the long-term financing to pay for those investments? How will they manage the everyday financial activities of the firm? Um, I'm sure some of you deal with these sorts of questions in your line of work. So 
you may be familiar already with business finance, but you may not, and you may want to know a little bit more about it if, even if you are familiar. So the course will be helpful with that. The next thing that we discuss in the chapter is the concept of a financial manager. Um, financial managers try to answer some or all of the questions we just discussed. The top financial manager within a firm is usually the CFO or the chief financial officer. Tends to be a vice president of some sort. Um, they usually manage the treasurer who oversees cash management, credit management, capital expenditures, and financial planning. Um, and they oversee the controller as well, who oversees taxes, cost accounting, financial accounting, and data processing. You can take a look at, let me try to find this. Close out of this one. A video on the role of a CFO. And this guy, Malcolm Wynum, How would you describe your role? Um, does a good job of breaking down some of the things that we're going to talk about in class. This is a five minute video. Um, and I think it's worthwhile for you to watch up front in class, not because you're going to understand all the terminology that he's going to throw around in this discussion, but. Um, the fact that by the end of class, I think you'll digest the majority of this information. So I think it's worthwhile for you to take a quick listen to now, but later on it'll be even more, more worthwhile. As, um, a role which has external facing uh, uh, roles and also internal facing roles. If we look at the external roles, uh, firstly there's um, the broad communication with the financial community, and that uh, can be categorized into three brief areas. and One is the uh, communication with investors, analysts, and uh, shareholders around the drivers of the business, the performance of the business, and also the risks inherent in achieving those uh, objectives. There's also uh, conversations with uh, debt holders and credit rating agencies around the strength of the balance sheet and also cash flow of the business, which is where those stakeholders focus. And finally, regulators, uh, commercial banks and also the investment banking community regarding access to equity capital markets and business development. In the internal focused role, I believe the CFO needs to be the uh, champion of financial excellence in the business. And that involves, first of all, leadership in the finance um, organization, ensuring that there is strong financial control and uh, financial compliance. There's also building a high-performance um, financial organization, and that's uh, around ensuring there's decision support, working with the executives on uh, operating matters and bringing uh, financial monitoring to bear. And there's also hiring, training, and retaining uh, finance staff, and uh, bringing best practice into accounting and reporting. The financial environment has changed markedly over the last couple of years. Where's your focus now? I think I've spent more time in the treasury areas and that involves first of all ensuring that there's liquidity within the business, that we have adequate facilities so that we can meet our commitments and uh, we have more than satisfied all the objectives that we set. Uh, we have adequate committed facilities and we're able to meet all of our requirements for our financial area um, over the next two years. Uh, there's also networking capital that we focused on, and uh, we've achieved uh, some success in this area with a $300 million inflow in the last six months to September 2009, and also in cost reduction and productivity initiatives, where again we've had substantial success, where this has resulted in an increase in 100 basis points in our operating margin over that last six months to the 30th September 2009. So what then are you doing to take costs out of the business? We've just announced a major business capability uh, program. And uh, this is going to reduce costs, it's going to simplify our processes, and it's going to allow local management to focus much more on consumer-related activities at the local operating level. Those benefits will be phased in over the next uh, three or four years, reaching a sustainable rate of about $300 million per annum in 2014. And we also expect networking capital benefits of about $350 million in the period 2010 to 2012. 
Turning then to risk, commodities and foreign exchange have been quite major financial risk factors. What are you doing to mitigate them? Uh, in the commodities, we have a uh, coordinated but regionally implemented program of commodity hedging. Now, that will be taken one step further when we implement our uh, business capability program whereby we will have a global procurement operation. We have seen that our cost of goods sold has increased at a much lower rate than the prices of uh, commodities. As far as foreign exchange is concerned, we have a similar uh, operation whereby we hedge all of our committed and also our expected um, commodity purchases. And that allows us as well to uh, take out the high the um, spikes in the um, foreign exchange prices against the dollar. SAB Miller played a key role in the consolidation of the global beer industry. What's your key criteria when looking at M&A transactions? Looking at um, consolidation opportunities, we have some very strict uh, criteria, both financial and strategic. From a financial point of view, we have a number of criteria involving weighted average cost of capital, uh, earnings and also um, cash payback. And also it's very important that we go EBA positive in approximately five years after acquisition. As far as earnings are concerned, we would like to ensure that we are earnings accretive, uh, certainly by the second year of the acquisition. The bottom line is that uh, we must have uh, a creation of shareholder value out of it. Okay, I'm going to end it there. Um, the reason that I think that that's an, a, a really good video to watch, first of all, he's, he's a high-profile CFO. Secondly, you know, he ends with that point on um, creating shareholder wealth as being the goal. Um, and that is the goal of finance. We're going to get to that in just a couple slides. But also he discusses a number of issues you may not be familiar with right now, or you may be, uh, or may have heard of before, but may, may not be terribly familiar with these terms that by the end of the class, you should be familiar with them. For example, he talks about networking capital. What is that? He talks about cost reductions. What are they? What are those types of techniques? He talks about liquidity. What is that? He talks about operating margins. What is that? He talks about hedging. What is that? He talks about the weighted average cost of capital. What is that? He talks about cost of goods sold. What is that? He talks about a number of issues like those that hopefully by the end of the class, I'll replay that video for you and you'll have a better understanding of what he's talking about. Um, I know that there's a lot of lingo tossed around in finance and part of the course is going to be learning to understand some of that, um, that language. Okay, so moving on. Talked a little about the CFO. How does the CFO fit in within the organizational chart? Uh, the CFO or the VP of finance is usually filled by someone with both an accounting and finance background, since the position has responsibility for both the controller, as you can see here, and the treasurer. Um, so it has, has the responsibility for the controller aspect of the firm and the treasury functions within the firm. Okay, so financial management decisions are going to be of chief concern for the CFO and all those in the area of finance. So what are some of these uh, decisions? Well, capital budgeting will be a huge one. Uh, questions like what long-term investments or projects should the business undertake? Capital budgeting's key concerns are going to be the time, timing, the size, and the risk of future cash flows. For example, what products will the firm sell? Should old equipment be replaced? And so on. Capital structure is another area. Um, here, questions could be, how should we pay for our assets? Should we use debt or equity? The capital structure is going to um, really describe you know, how much you should take part in debt or equity. So examples here could be, you know, what are the least expensive sources of funds? Is there an optimal mix? And so on. And then finally, working capital management, a question here could be, how do we manage day-to-day -day finances of the firm? An example could be of a question asked here is, how much inventory should we hold? That sort of thing. So an organization itself can be structured in various ways. And there's three forms um, 
that are primary in the United States. The sole proprietorship, you can think of like a, a pizza shop or something like that. A partnership, which could be either general or limited. General is going to be totally liable. And limited means it's, it's limited to what is contributed. Uh, and then, of course, a corporation. You could have a limited liability company, which kind of blends a partnership with a corporation, or an S-corp, which is a corporation that's taxed differently. It pays no corporate tax, and you pass the income to shareholders who then get taxed. Choosing the best type of structure here um, is going to be a key decision. It's definitely something you're going to need to think about for your capstone presentation and what you decide there. So. Keep in mind that this information is out there and you can kind of look this sort of thing up online to find out which would be the best fit for your particular topic that you choose. Let's go through them a little bit more in depth though. So what's a sole proprietorship? This is a business owned by one person. The advantages to this are it's easy to start, it's not very regulated, uh, there's a single owner who keeps all the profits, so it's kind of simplistic in that matter, and it's taxed once as personal income. The disadvantages are it's limited to the life of the owner, so if you pass away, so does the business. The equity capital is limited to the owner's personal wealth. Um, there's unlimited liability, and it's difficult to sell owner ownership interest. The next one was a partnership, and this is a business owned by two or more people. The advantages here are there's two or more owners. Uh, another advantage is it's more capital available. It's relatively easy to start. Um, income is taxed once as personal income. The disadvantages are it's, there's an unlimited liability. Um, for a general partnership is, is considered portion of that unlimited liability. Here all the partners share in the gains and losses and all have unlimited liability um, because this is that because of this, written agreements are essential. A limited partnership, one or more of the partners run the business and have unlimited liability, but the liability is limited to contribution in the partnership for the others. Um, another disadvantage is the partnership dissolves when one partner dies or wishes to sell. And finally, it's difficult to transfer ownership. The last form of a business is a corporation. And this is a legal, quote, person distinct from owners of um, owners and a resident of the state. The advantages here is a limited liability, it's unlimited life, it's separation of ownership and management, it's transfer of ownership is easy, and it's easier to raise capital. A disadvantage is the separation of ownership and management. See, there's a, pr there's a plus to that and there's a minus. The minus aspect is, is the agency problem, which is something we'll talk about in a little bit. And another disadvantage is a double taxation. So income is taxed at the corporate rate, and then dividends are taxed at the personal rate, while dividends are paid are not tax deductible. So that's one of the negatives of a corporation. Um, so so there's some of the pros here. You have uh, of, of the separation of ownership. You have uh, diversify ownership into different businesses, take advantage of expertise. It's easier to transfer ownership. Cons like. Once again, the agency problems if management and owner's goals aren't aligned. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we move forward. There's also international corporate forms. Um, for example, the joint stock companies. This kind of falls between partnerships and corporations, as does limited liability companies. Public limited companies offer shares to the public and is limited liability. All these share those, the public ownership uh, component and the limited liability component. Okay, so a while back in that video, the, the uh, individual mentioned that the goal of financial management is um, to maximize shareholder wealth. So this question is asking, you know, is, is that mean, you know, should it be maximized profit? This wouldn't necessarily be a precise goal according to finance. Maximize what profit? Short run or long run? Accounting profit? Are you taking into account cash flows? Lots of questions asked there, so it's not necessarily maximize profit. Is it minimizing cost? You know, reducing costs can sometimes damage long-run liability. Um, so that might not be the answer either. How about maximizing market share? You know, many dot-coms tried to do this. They raised capital, increased advertisements, which increased hits, but there was no real revenue production. The stock prices eventually fell, and they couldn't raise more capital. 
maximizing the current value per share of the company's existing stock is the is the best method here. So to maximize the market value of the existing owner's equity is the more general goal. Does this mean we should do anything and everything to maximize owner wealth? You know, should we get involved in outsourcing, offshoring? Should we follow Enron's lead? Um, is corporate support of charities necessarily a negative? No, unethical behavior or ethical behavior um, can distort this. So unethical behavior does not ultimately benefit shareholders. And overly ethical behavior can actually benefit shareholders. So the, the, the idea of um, supporting charities can be a benef benefit for you in the long run, although it won't necessarily hit your bottom line immediately. Unethical behavior is going to may but benefit your bottom line in the short run, but in the long run, it most likely won't. So you need to kind of balance a bunch of things in, in talking about maximizing shareholder wealth. We're not just discussing shareholder wealth right now. We're talking about it over the long run. Speaking of Enron, um, there were a number of corporate accounting scandals in the early well, the late 90s and the early 2000s, um, driven by, um, well, well, Sarbanes-Oxley was driven by co these cor various corporate accounting scandals. The, these took place at Enron, Tyco, WorldCom, and Adelphia, and I think the book goes into some detail on each of these. And Sarbanes-Oxley was intended to strengthen protection against accounting fraud and financial malpractice. The problem is that compliance costs associated with Sarbanes-Oxley uh, were costly and firms were in some cases driven to go public outside the U.S. or go private, what they call go dark. And the book provides an example of a technology firm saving $2 million a year for, for listing on the London Stock Exchange um, rather than NASDAQ due to Sarbanes-Oxley. Yet, there's it's considered to be a relatively good thing by some. So I do think it's worthwhile to at least show you that there's a video on here about that. And I'm not going to get into these videos. You can do these on your own. I don't, I don't think we're running out of time here as far as my video goes. So do these videos on your own. Take a look at them as far as what Sarbanes actually was and um, why it's um, a big issue within the world of finance. Moving on, we did discuss already, at least we mentioned, the agency problem. And um, let me get into a little bit more in-depth into this. The agency relationship is a situation where a principal hires an agent to represent its interest. So, for example, stockholders are the principals who hire managers or the agents to run the company. The agency problem is a conflict of interest between the principal and the agent. You can think of this like insurance where you have the insurer and the insuree. You know, they're trying to monitor what we do as people being insured by the insurers, and they want to make sure that we're not too risky, but they can't know. There's, a, there's not enough information there, which creates the agency problem. So this is also true for stockholders and managers. Uh, management goals and agency costs, um, there's, there's a parallel there. So there's questions involved. Do, do managers act in the shareholders' interest? And there's ways to try to um, create incentives for them to act in shareholders' interest. For example, incentives can be used to align management and stockholder interest via managerial compensation. Incentives need to be carefully structured to ensure that they achieve their goal. Corporate control, if needed, threat of takeover may result in better management. And then you can think of other stakeholders who are involved here as well, creditors, employees, and customers. Um, all would be involved in this aspect as well. Occasionally, these slides throw in an, an example like this. I don't exactly know why they place them in the areas they do because it's not necessarily tangential to the flow of the storyline here. But I do have to say um, it is relevant. Finance.yahoo uh, is a good site for any information that you're going to be looking for any of the um, stocks that you're picking. So here's an example of some of the stocks and their ticker symbols. And you can go on uh, 
Yahoo Finance site and write that, put in their ticker, see how the stock is doing. I, I look at Yahoo Finance frequently just for financial information, so it's a pretty good site. Okay, only a little bit more here. Um, all right, the cash flows between the firm and financial markets is uh, is something that book, book goes on to discuss. The main point here is that cash comes into the firm from the sale of debt and equity. Money from that is used to purchase assets, and the assets generate money used to pay stockholders, to reinvest in more assets, to repay debt holders, or to pay dividends to stockholders. So there's kind of, in a sense, this flow of funds moving from um, assets to financial markets and so on and so forth. The chapter is going to end discussing cash flows to the firm and discussing briefly primary versus secondary markets. Primary markets are markets where security are sold by the company. Um, they're there's public placement, SEC regulation, underwriters are all part of the primary market. And the key feature here is the money is raised goes to the issuing company. The secondary market is the market we're actually more familiar with. Here the market, this is the market where securities have already been issued and are traded. The stock exchanges like the NYSC and the over-the-counter markets um, like, uh, like the NYSC are, are secondary. Um, Funds are exchanged by buyer and seller with no uh, participation by the company. So, long story short, public offerings, private placements, they take place in the pri primary market. Secondary market is where we get involved. So, in other words, when you heard of the IPO for Facebook or for Twitter or for whatever, it has been the most recent IPO, that takes place in the primary market. That's where all the big, big players take place. So when a new IPO comes out, they have to establish a price. And they go to underwriters to do that. When we get involved as investors, it's typically because we're smaller, we get involved in the secondary market. So when you trade a stock, it's traded in the secondary market in general. Uh, this also goes on to distinguish between dealer and auction markets. A dealer market is a market with several traders who maintain an inventory and securities. They trade and provide prices at which they bid and ask for the securities. NASDAQ is a dealer market. An auction market is something like the NYSE. Uh, it generally has a physical location. Stocks are traded here are considered to be quote unquote listed. Okay, we're going to end here. Um, I really strongly encourage you to go back through the chapter and read it. Uh, especially since we didn't have the, the opportunity to elaborate really in depth with this first chapter. But I really think it's going to be manageable now that you listen to the lecture. Go back through and read the chapter. Maybe work on the case that's associated with the chapter. I think that that could be helpful. Maybe some of the uh, questions towards the end of the chapter to get kind of a feel for what the chapter was asking. And then we'll get together next time and uh, we'll have our quiz and we'll see how you, how you did digesting the material. Look forward to talking to you all.